Hello, opera lovers, and welcome to Opera 101 with the Cleveland Opera Theater. My name is Stephanie Russo, and I'm an Education and Outreach Associate with the Cleveland Opera Theater. So I'm welcoming you here today for Opera 101, which is for all ages. Uh, so everybody gather around, and we're going to talk about our daily facet fun tidbit to help you understand or love opera even more than you already do. So um, if you have any questions and you want to know any particular bit of information, please do drop it in the comment box at any time and we'll chat in real time. Or feel free to email me at sruzo at clevelandoperatheater.org. Uh, that's S-R-U-O-Z-Z-O at clevelandoperatheater.org. And I'll be happy to get you any information you're looking for, discuss anything further, any questions you might have. Um, so let's talk. And welcome to Rossini Month with the Cleveland Opera Theater. All through June, we were talking Verdi. Uh, and this month, we're going to go back in time just a few decades to talk about Rossini. And to understand Rossini, and in fact, all of bel canto opera, we have to understand the way Rossini structured each of his scenes. Um, and in fact, this structure was so common, pretty much all bel canto composers used it. And we've been talking about this fast, slow, two-part dichotomy um, with Verdi and how he broke down the form. But now that we're going back in time a few decades, let's talk about the composer who really built that form up. So we're going to get deeper into this two-part form today, known as la solita forma, the usual form or the, the common form, because it was so universal and everybody used it. So it was usual, la solita forma. And la solita forma was a term used by Abramo Bazevi, who was Verdi's contemporary and first biographer, to describe the basic scene structure of bel canto opera. And that's the way he would help us analyze each of the bel canto scenes. It was also known at that time as grand double aria form, and now some historians like to call it the Rossini Code. Code in the sense of rules and regulations more than, you know, cryptic messages. I'm going to call it the Rossini Code just because, doggone it, that sounds so much more fun than grand double aria form. So the Rossini Code was uh, kind of the map for all big scenes and most cavatinas, which were the introductory arias for each character. So when a character would come on stage for the first time in a show, they would sing a cavatina. That was their way to introduce themselves to the audience. So all of these big scenes and most of the cavatinas were based on some variant of la solita forma. And we do mean variant here. Um, Remember that formal experimentation led by Verdi was prominent throughout most of the 19th century. So all composers might have been working from the same frame, but adjusted it to suit their needs. And in fact, to communicate some unusual aspect of the drama. In fact, they could make very pointed um, statements about the pace of the drama by cutting certain sections or elongating them or repeating whatever we might not expect to be repeated, adding something we might not expect to have added. Um, and so this, this La Solita Forma was just a basic roadmap that composers could use and audiences would understand where we were supposed to go at each point in the drama and composers could riff on where we were going at each point. And it was a way of, um, it was a method of communication between stage and house, if you will. So the basic layout of La Solita Forma is an orchestral beginning, and this orchestral beginning sets the tone. It lets us know what kind of mood we should be feeling. It lets us know um, what kind of events are about to transpire. Practically speaking, it gives the singer time to communicate something physically about the character. So they're probably entering on stage at this point and the way they're walking, their motions, um, what they do on stage, certain actions they might take are all telling us something about the, uh, about the character on stage. And this orchestral introduction gives time for the singer to communicate that before they actually even start singing. Um, then after this orchestral introduction, there was some kind of recitative or, or singing that would scan as speech uh, to communicate new information, to communicate uh, either a plot event moving forward or some previously unknown fact, some insight about the drama. And it would move us forward in time in the opera. 
So this recitative section is called parlante or talking. So it's a talking section where action happens. After this parlante section, we have a slow lyrical section where the emphasis is on creating these, the um, lyrical melody, uh, a simple and yet florid, something pleasing to the ear was the entire goal of this first slow lyrical aria. So again, we've got orchestral section, parlante, slow lyrical aria section. Then another freer section dominated by recitative with more new information or events. Um, often in the middle of the scene here, there would be something shocking happen, some complete reversal that would absolutely stun the audience and, and uh, turn the drama on its head. So this freer section, which was a, called a, another parlante section, is now faster and, and rapid and, and pushing us forward, propelling us, whereas the earlier part of the scene would have been um, at a more relaxed pace. This um, second fast parlante section was followed by a dazzlingly fast section of vocal pyrotechnics, where the emphasis is on singing as ornate a melody as possible. Uh, and these ornate melodies were then usually repeated with added improvised embellishments and flourishes by the singer. So the composer would say, repeat this section, and then it would be up to the singer to make that repetition as interesting as possible by adding all of the ornaments and flourishes they could possibly fit in to that, um, that repeat. So in brief, we've got orchestral section, a slow kinetic parlante section where things move forward, a slow static section where we're ruminating on an emotion or thoughts, a fast kinetic section, that second parlante where things again move forward, and a final static section where things are, um, the, the vocal pyrotechnics are exploding and we're just dazzled by the brilliance of these melodies. So this basic structure could play out in three possible ways. The first was a grand duet. So it would start out, this grand duet uh, would start out with a shena, which is the orchestral part, literally scene. So in other words, the orchestra is setting the scene for us in the shena. The first slow parlante section would be the tempo d'attacco, or uh, the speed of attack, the time of attack, beginning time basically. Um, so it's a slow parlante section in what we would think of as free verse, what the Italians called versi sciolti, without rhyme or consistent meter. If you read it on the page, it scans like regular speaking, and it just sounds like conversation, regular dialogue. After this parlante tempo di taco section, you have an adagio, so it's the first lyrical static section. Now, rather than being in free verse, it's in rhymed poetry or versi lirici, lyric lines. Um, once this adagio is over, you've got the tempo di mezzo, middle time, medium right here, and it's picking up speed. So we're getting into that faster section. It's another parlante. New information is conveyed in another kinetic section, moving the plot forward. And again, we're in free verse or versi sciolti because it's conversational, not poetic. Uh, and finally, um, we've got what we call the cabaletta, which is that last fireworky section. Um, it's again static emotionally, so it's not um, conveying new plot points, but um, it's just it's meant to astound us with the virtuosity of the performers. The second way this scene structure could play out was in an aria. So we had a grand duet where people would be singing to each other. It could also just be a duet for a solo singer. And uh, this, the structure was basically the exact same as the grand duet. The only difference is rather than having people sing back and forth at each other, you've got just a soloist. And finally, um, the other way this could play out is when you've got a whole group, the whole ensemble on stage in a central finale. 
So it's got the same sections, but the terminology is a little different. And now that there are lots of people on stage, not just one or two, we've actually got some options to get a little bit more elaborate. So the orchestral Shana um, that starts out the scene could be replaced by a chorus, so everybody is singing, a ballet, so we've got some dancers on stage communicating that information, or even a smaller, simpler aria that leads into the, the central finale scene. So um, the group is bigger and we can do a few more different things in that first section that would have just been for an orchestra in the smaller versions. Then finally, the adagio is called the pezzo concertato. Those are that slow lyric aria is the pezzo concertato and the cabaletta is called the stretta. A rhyme, it's kind of easy to remember that way. Um, so with the central finale, again, when we've got the whole ensemble on stage, um, the terminology is just slightly different, but the structure is still overarching, almost identical. The perfect example of this structure, and perfect for Rossini month, is Rosina's Act One Cavatina from the Barber of Seville, Una Voce Poco Fa. And I want you to notice, uh, I've put a, a YouTube link here in the comments, uh, and hopefully you're going to listen to it, please. It's so gorgeous, and you have to. Um, but when you do listen to it, I'm counting on you, notice that when she repeats the cabaletta, that fast pyrotechnic section at the end, she ornaments the melody very heavily in ways that aren't present on the first statement of that melody. So the second time she sings something, she's going to make it interesting by improvising these ornaments, especially on the words cento trappole or 100 tricks. So she's playing tricks with her voice at the same time she's talking about tricking her guardian. So whenever she says she'll set traps and she'll be tricky, that's when she gets the most ornate. And this is the ultimate proof, uh, listening to Una Voce Poco Fa and the way th uh, the singers interpret this is the ultimate proof that understanding the Rossini Code helps us to understand bel canto operas in general. So I wanna throw out a final call for any questions you may have, anybody who wants to know any final thing. And if not, again, feel, please do feel free to email me. Um, check out our website at clevelandoperatheater.org to sign up for the mailing list and get all of our information about some great events coming up, including our July 25th concert. You're gonna to wanna to see it. It's gonna be good, I promise. Um, don't forget to like our Facebook page, join us on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. We have different content on all those platforms, um, you know, interactive fun stuff, or just, you know, something for a little opera-related ooh and ah on the daily. And until then, we'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye.